Hello and welcome to the first Python physics video. This has taken a little bit longer than planned to release. It was supposed to just be a live recording of a meeting where I presented on ways in which I was using uh, the Python programming language within my high school physics class. And then a, another second presentation by Professor Brian Lane, who works at the University of North Florida, who has shared a little bit of information on his own community, Let's Code Physics and also the Pickup Community, uh, which stands for the Partnership for the Integration of Computation in Undergraduate Physics, a community that, that has started focusing mostly on undergraduate physics, but is starting to transition now to um, encompass high school physics education as well. Unfortunately, my part of that meeting uh, did not record too well. I had uh, pretty severe connection issues, actually, and I apologize to, to anybody that was at that event and had to struggle through trying to understand me through the, uh, the bleeps and the bloops and the, the, the sounds and video issues that I had. So I pre-recorded my segment, and then I will transition to Professor Lane's live recording uh, and the Q&A. The Q&A mostly recorded okay, apart from the very last comment by myself. So I've re-recorded that as well. So apologies for anybody that was waiting for this video. I know it's taken a bit longer than planned to get out. I just wanted to make sure that it was perfect um, so that it would be of some value uh, to anybody interested in the event that was unable to make the event. If you would like to make the next event though, please do consider joining the um, Code Academy community that I, I run the Python physics events out of. Uh, there's a link for that in the description to this video. Please also consider joining uh, Professor Lane's Let's Code Physics YouTube community and also the wider pickup community um, that has a Slack channel that you can join. And there's a website that you can post some activities that you, may, you might make following this video uh, to teach physics through the art of computation. So without further ado, let's uh, transition into my uh, first presentation and then we'll follow that with Professor Lane's presentation and a, a quick Q&A right at the end. Hi, my name is Anthony and I'm from Wales originally in the UK, but I've been working internationally for about eight years now. In fact, exactly eight years now, uh, all the time as a middle and high school physics teacher. But for four of those years, I was a technology integration coach. So helping teachers across all curriculum areas to integrate technology into their classrooms. Um, and now more recently as a curriculum coordinator, so kind of overseeing the uh, coordination of all of the um, middle year uh, subject areas. So I'm very interested in, in both technology, obviously still physics education, but also the, the kind of broader landscape of, um, of middle school education. Um, in particular, I'm, I'm highly interested in the role that computational thinking might have to play in the future of technology integration in middle schools. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Uh, we've got two speakers today, in fact. Uh, you've got myself, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, my live recording didn't record too well, so this is uh, recorded after the event. Um, so I can say that you've got a fantastic uh, presentation coming up by Professor Brian Lane, who runs the Let's Code Physics community. Uh, he's going to talk uh, a little bit about Let's Code Physics, a bit about the role of computation, uh, and also about a community you might not have heard of. I certainly hadn't heard of it before uh, reaching out to Brian Lane, uh, which is the Pickup Community, which is the uh, Partnership for the Integration of Computation in undergraduate physics. Okay, uh, and then right at the end, you'll have a look at a couple of the exercise sets that the pickup community have, um, have put together for teachers like us. Okay, so I'd like to start on uh, computational thinking. Uh, it's something that's been close to my heart for a while now, something that I've, I've gone on all manner of courses and read all manner of, of articles, uh, journals and, and books on. Um, but I always want to start a conversation about computational thinking with an image like this. Um, take a look at the image uh, for just a moment, and can you guess uh, what this image is showing you? During the live event, I put this forward to Professor Lane, uh, and he was able to, uh, to actually identify the image immediately. So let's actually jump to, to his response 
and then I'll do a bit of talking about it after that. As the image result, do you know what, what we're looking at? I don't know the specific image, but having watched Hidden Figures, I know that these women are engaged in a job known as a computer, meaning yeah, they're employed exactly. to, to do computations. And so it was the, the, the male director would assign to the female computers, here is all the computations we need done. And if we're really desperate, we'll bring in uh, women of ethnic minorities as well, and not just white women. Uh, and then they, they likely do not have their names on any of the uh, credits or authorships for the studies that they are participating in. That is exactly right. And uh, it's funny, Hidden Figures uh, comes up so frequently <laughs> now when I, when I show that, um, that image. If, if anybody uh, listening or, or watching this isn't familiar with the movie, I, I can't recommend it enough. Um, absolutely fantastic film. So good. But, so as you can see there, um, Professor Lane knew exactly what we were looking at. This is in fact a room full of human computers. The reason that I like to start with this image whenever I talk about computational thinking is because it's important to realize what computational thinking is allowing us to do. Um, computation used to be a uniquely human thing. It used to be something that we needed humans to do. That isn't the case anymore. Now we can get machines to compute things just fine, provided we're able to explain to the machines what it is that we want them to do. Um, so in order to offset that, that massive cognitive load of, of running who knows how many, how many equations and formulae, um, in order to, to offset that process, we need to be able to communicate to the machines just fine what it is that we want them to do. And then also we need to be able to understand the machine's response. Uh, so we can now think of uh, computational thinking as the ability to phrase questions, to phrase inquiries in such a way that we can give a machine a number of the correct types of inputs and we can both read and understand the outputs that that machine is throwing us. Uh, and in the process of doing this, we can answer our own questions. Uh, so we can formulate a question in such a way that a machine is able to do that for us. Now I teach the International Baccalaureate Framework and within that framework, we have a number of what we call approaches to learning or ATL skills. Um, there are three skills that are tied to thinking um, and the ones that, that we focus on so far and have done for a long time now are creative, thinking skills and critical thinking skills. Um, so that's that's one way, I suppose, of, of drawing a line in the sand between the, the kind of more systems approach of thinking um, and then the, the kind of looser, more, for want of a better word, creative way of thinking, out of the box uh, thinking, I suppose. Um, so we, we deal with those two kind of halves of the, the thinking landscape, but then also, I, I did say there were three, uh, we also then have a look at what we call transfer skills. So the ability to transfer um, from one modality to another. So sometimes a question might be tackled using both critical and creative thinking. And how well do we switch between those two thought processes and in such a way that, that nothing is lost along the way. Um, so we've got this kind of nice um, framework now where we've got two two types of thinking and the ability to jump between the two. Um, the more and more I talk about computational thinking, the more I want to see a framework like this be developed, where we are acknowledging the fact that a lot of thinking, the specifically the computational thinking, is offset and it is done on device. Uh, many of our students now bring their own devices into school or have access to devices within school. Um, so I think this is a, a kind of admission of the fact that, yes, there's a lot of creative and critical thinking happening within our own students' minds, but there is a lot of thinking that needs to be acknowledged that's done by the technologies that they use. And it's just as important to be able to transfer from creative to computational or critical to computational as it is between um, creative and critical. Um, so this is something that I would like to see uh, developed in, in schools over time. This is, of course, just a, a rudimentary 
picture of a framework that, that may um, hopefully uh, be further developed over time. Uh, when we talk about computational thinking, that's really thinking kind of within mind, uh, so thinking creatively and cri critically uh, in such a way that we can offset some of that onto the machine. So I suppose computational thinking would be best represented uh, by these two arrows from uh, creative to uh, computational and critical to computational. Um, there are many, many, many frameworks uh, that have been developed for um, trying to, again, draw lines in the sand around what, it, uh, what the computational thinking process actually looks like. One of the more basic ones I found, and to be honest, at, at this stage, that makes it one of the more useful ones that I found and one that you're likely to find time and time again if you do your own research into, into what computational thinking might look like in the middle and, um, and high school um, setting uh, is this. So we've got uh, four sections for computational thinking that is challenging a student to decompose uh, their large systems into smaller subsystems or to decompose a problem into smaller, more manageable parts or chunks. There is the ability to abstract something that can be quite complex into just its essential elements, something that actually as physics teachers, we find ourselves doing almost every day. Um, and also pattern recognition as, as physics and, and in the wider science teacher community, we are forever encouraging our students and teaching our students to recognize relationships between variables. Um, so as a physics teacher, we're probably looking at these four subsections of computational thinking and thinking to ourselves, well, I do this all the time anyway, I just call it this. I think what could be useful across an entire secondary school is actually trying to narrow in on that computational thinking language and to use this language so that students can see, sim see similarities between subjects. So as much as pattern recognition in science means um, drawing a graph, making a scatter plot, and, and seeing that there's a, a positive correlation between two variables, pattern recognition in English might be something completely different. In, in language and literature, it could be looking for patterns within poetry. Um, within music, it could be looking at themes that occur um, on repetition throughout a musical piece. Um, you always feel free to laugh at me when I try to talk, um, <laughs> when I try to talk uh, about other, other um, subject areas. Uh, and then finally, we've got algorithm design. Uh, so algorithm design is kind of packaging the entire process in such a way that it can be followed easily by other people or indeed by a computer. So can we do this in such a way that many of the steps can be automated and maybe some of the outputs for one process automatically become an input for another process. Uh, there's a, a heap of ways that we can interpret these um, subjects, subsections of computation. And in fact, I had a really good question during the live event where somebody asked if this is, if this only belongs in STEAM education. Uh, so at this point, actually, I think I'll, I'll cut the video and play that question or mind my response to that question. So I posed the question, oh, yeah. do you think there's any possibilities for teaching computational thinking in other subjects beyond STEM? So let's say I let's say I'm I'm working with a history teacher. They yeah. in principle work with data. I don't know if they're willing to incorporate some computational thinking stuff in their course. What what do you think about that? Yeah, so I I it's a really good question. And um my answer might have been no until I went through the um, computational thinking course with Google, uh, which is full of examples of using computational thinking in other subject areas. And one of the ones that really stood out for me was, um, I think it was, it was making a movie. So it was, uh, you know, maybe a, a visual arts teacher or working with a, a, a drama teacher and just using the, the, the computational terminology, but in a way that that I've never really, um, I've never really looked at it in, in that way. So in terms of um, decomposition, it, it wasn't so much decomposing the pro a physics problem or decomposing a, you know, a very difficult um, scientific question. It was decomposing the process of, of making a movie. 
So it was breaking that down into, right, well, we need a cameraman and we need a script writer and we need somebody who's, who's acting. And I think, although that might not translate directly and, and all too freely with, um, mm -hmm. with physics, I think when students are, are accessing those ideas using different perspectives like yes. that, I think that should be incredibly valuable. Um, so, I, yeah, I don't think they're going to pick up exactly the same skills uh, mm -hmm. when they're using it on STEM fields, but I think in terms of understanding the process and and what we mean by, you know, de decomposing a problem and by trying to create an abstraction. Um, so what have we got from uh, Marie? Decomposition, given a project and guide students to create some planning. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So breaking a, a complex project into, into multiple tasks. Um, and I, I do, I, I recommend going through the, the Google course because they, they really are trying to speak to not just STEM teachers. I think they are trying to make a case for computational thinking to exist in all subject areas. So I'm, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad I jumped out there. <laughs> I'm glad I saw your question. Okay. So hopefully that was, that was useful. Um, the, I think the crux of it, so the final slides I've got on computational thinking is the, the kind of small response I have as to why computational thinking, I think, has an important role in secondary education. Um, and that's the fact that if we're all using the same language across all of our disciplines, we're using words like algorithmic thinking, or if we're using words like decomposition, pattern recognition, then we're showing our students how they can better integrate their technology immediately into that subject area. So in ways that maybe individual teachers haven't spotted, uh, it may be the students that say, oh, this is pattern recognition. This is a process that I do in this way, in this other subject, uh, maybe it will work here. Um, so what we're really doing there is making education a, a truly interdisciplinary uh, pursuit um, by bringing technology and the, the way that technology can serve a mo modality of thinking um, into every every lesson and every classroom. Okay, so straight into the the Python physics section then. So how have I managed to use Python uh, to teach physics and also to bring a little bit of computational thinking into my own classroom? Well, the first step for my approach is to find or get some data. So one way that you can get data is to get secondary data. And there's a bunch of repositories that you can use in order to, to, get, to get data. Uh, one of which is the Kaggle website. If you've not been on the Kaggle website, that is a uh, community and a database full of large data sets for all manner of, um, of problems and questions. So the community often runs comp competitions, often um, organizations get involved in those competitions, they provide their own data, and then are cash rewards for, um, for finding unique insights into those data sets. Um, so really, really good place to learn the basics of data science, which is essentially what we're, what we're talking about here, but through a physics context, uh, in a physics context. Uh, but not so much for specific physics data. Uh, you might find some, uh, but it's, it's certainly not a repository of physics data. Uh, the same with the subreddit r slash data. Now you can go there and find some really interesting data sets. And you can also see interesting ways that people have transformed data sets um, in order to to show something or to answer a question. There is another subreddit actually called Data is Beautiful, which is great um, for seeing the unique ways that people construct these visualizations. Um, another place you can go actually, which might surprise some people is GitHub. Now, a lot of people think of GitHub as a repository for code. Um, yes, uh, certainly there's, there's a lot of version control and, and uh, code that goes on GitHub, but because that kind of pull and fork uh, functionality is just so useful. There's also a lot of other um, things being made on GitHub, things like um, open source textbooks or or guidebooks. Um, it's also being used quite largely as a repository for, for CSV files and for data sets, um, obviously because then those CSV files and data sets can be used within the, the, the code repository and by the open source community. 
Uh, so that's where I found uh, a lot of the codes actually that I've used in secondary school, just by chancing upon data that that is being used um, for practice data science projects. Um, two other places you can go. The last two things I've got here are Vernier and Firefox. Now, a lot of us are probably familiar with Vernier. Um, we might have Vernier data loggers in our own schools. If you go onto the Vernier website, you can access a Google Doc uh, that contains uh, sample data for almost every experiment that, that you can think of um, that's been collected using. Sorry, I didn't understand. I should probably unplug Google Home, shouldn't I? Sorry, Google, you know. Um, so Vernier actually offers a uh, sample data set for almost every experiment that you, you can think of. Uh, and that sample data is being collected using Vernier sensors. So if you don't have your own sensors or if you don't have time to run and to do an, a certain experiment, you just want to get to the, the kind of data wrangling and, and using Python on that data, then you can certainly go to that website and collect that data. Um, what you will see uh, from the screenshot I've got is that um, a lot of the data requires the Logger Pro 3 software. Now, that isn't free. Um, you will need to purchase that if you don't have it already, but many of us in schools will already have access to that software. If you don't, uh, there's also a lot of um, there's a lot of sample data below this that uses uh, Vernier graphical analysis, and that is, in fact, something that you can download for free. Uh, so maybe just focus on the graphical analysis stuff at first um, if you don't have access or can't get access to Logger Pro 3. Uh, at the bottom here, then, we've also got um, an ex a screen grab of the Firefox sensor database, which is a community run. So this isn't collected by Firefox themselves. It's submitted by people who are using their mobile phones to run different science experiments, and they're sharing their um their sensor data so again a really useful space and and both of these are um or they are science education specific um so you know you'll you'll you're more likely to find a lot of useful things here in a short amount of time than you will uh traverse in the likes of kaggle or github okay so once you've got the data the question probably is well what do i do with the data um in order to learn to transform data using Python, you're going to need to be familiar with three Python libraries. So the first library you're going to want to familiarize yourself with is the Python NumPy library. Uh, what NumPy allows you to do is all manner of mathematical uh, operations quite easily, um, and it allows you to do that on large lists or arrays of numbers. Uh, in order to get large lists and arrays and data frames of numbers and to have it so that it's going to be very easily transformed in this way, you're also going to want to be familiar with the pandas library. Uh, now, what pandas does is it will turn a CSV document into something called a pandas data frame. The pandas data frame is a far easier and more manageable data set for uh, something like Python to transform and to work with. Um, so you're going to need to know a little bit of panda, pandas. And then finally, once you've got your data uh, in in a form that you would then like to visualize, you'd like to turn that into maybe a scatter plot or a bar graph or, or a pie chart. Um, the library that you're going to want to use for that, or at least the, the first library you're going to want to learn for that, is the matplot library. Um, so matplot library will allow you to um, to turn those data sets into all kinds of visualizations. There are a lot of other libraries that will do that, and some people might argue that the other libraries give you better looking transformations. Um, I'm not gonna get into that, but matplot library is certainly where I would recommend starting in the data visualization um, journey that you'll be taking. Okay, so three libraries that we need to learn. Where can we go to learn those things? Well, it'd be remiss of me to not mention Code Academy itself. Uh, they've got a fantastic uh, course called Visualize Data with Python. Uh, which, as you can see from the screenshot, I'm enrolled on myself. I haven't actually got to the end of that yet. Um, but what I really like about Code Academy courses is that I am always coding. Um, so every lesson has a terminal next to the, the information, and that will allow me to just get straight into the coding. It's always quite a short activity, so I can really manage the amount of time that I'm coding for really easily. I can close the page when I'm done and then open up another day and, and take off right where I left off. 
Um, there is also a course called Data Analysis with Python that's run by Free Code Camp. Um, now, the clue is in the name there that that is a completely free course. Um, and I do really like Free Code Camp's courses as well. I've done their JavaScript course in its, in its entirety. Um, I felt that I learned a lot uh, when I went through through that course. So it is on my list for this summer to get through the Free Code Camp Data Analysis with Python course as well, uh, just to see what additional learning there might be in that course. Um, in terms of shorter courses, though, ones that you can do in maybe just a couple of days, um, I would recommend the Pandas and the Data Visualization courses on the website Kaggle. Um, they are really good tutorials. Um, they seem to have gotten a bit better each time I return to Kaggle to check them out. And they are where I tend to send students when they're at the very, very beginning of their, um, of their journey. Uh, that might change to Code Academy now because of uh, the recent uh, deals that they're doing for schools. And it is quite cheap to get your entire cohort onto Code Academy these days. So I, I may... Next year, it may be Code Academy that we're using instead. Um, now, once you've learned how to transform the data and you've got the data, you go, you're going to want to actually do it. Now, the platform that I recommend for that uh, as a teacher uh, and certainly for, for this kind of data science element uh, is Google Collaboratory. Now, I feel like I need to say straight away that this is a great solution for what I'm doing with Python. It's less of a solution for what Brian will go through uh, in his session. Um, so don't register this as the, the ultimate tool. Um, the more time you spend trying to do different things with Python, the quicker you'll understand that some environments are just better suited to some activities with Python. Google Collaboratory is great for dealing with data. Um, you can think of it, if you know what a Jupyter Notebook is, you can think of it as a Jupyter Notebook that exists within Google Drive. If you don't know what a Google, <laughs> what a Jupyter Notebook is, um, you can think of it as a kind of merger of a word processing document like a Google Doc or Microsoft Word, along with a coding environment. Um, so somewhere where you can write um, standard markup text to explain what it is you're doing. And then right after that, you can have a coding panel um, that will then allow you to write and run some code. Uh, the beauty of Google Colab is that it exists within Google Drive. That means that you don't need to install anything on your machine. And even more importantly, you don't need to install anything on your students' machines. They can access it straight from Google Drive. But it also means that it's highly shareable. So the same way that I would share a Google document or a Google slide deck uh, with my students, I can share a, a Google Colab in the same way. Um, finally, that third bullet point, there is a built-in library uh, that contains all manner of code snippets for everything from visualization to, to dealing with data. Um, so I, it, it's a really nice place to start as a, as a kind of newbie because you can go through that code snippet library and just look at the code that it throws for certain operations. Um, so you can go down through... Um, visualization, you can see that there's an option for an interactive scatter plot. Click on that and just see the code that drops in. Maybe even try remixing and modifying that to see what impact that has on your, your visualization. So that in itself is quite a good um, learning activity for students. Um, but I haven't mentioned the best thing yet. Uh, for many of us, we're using Google Apps for education with our students, and that means that we're using Google Classroom to run the kind of day-to-day -day administ um, administration of, of documents that we're giving students and, and assignments. And since Colab exists on Google Drive, you probably guessed it by now, it will run through a Google Classroom, which is great news. Um, so if you have a Google Classroom with all of your students in and you've just made a killer Colab template that runs through all of the introductory kind of data science that you can do to learn a bit of physics, you can then distribute that Colab file using uh, Google Classroom's assignments feature. And that means that it will create a copy of that document for each student. It'll copy you into each document so you have access to each student's Colab file and it will append that, within, append that with their name. 
Um, so a really, really useful feature. And honestly, probably one of the best workflows I've ever found for dealing with the Python programming language within a classroom environment. So I cannot recommend that highly enough. Um, once you've, you've distributed, or I suppose while you're in the process of making that Colab file, um, one of the code snippets that you're definitely going to want to include for your students is the one that allows them to import the Google Sheets CSV file. Um, yes, there's already a code snippet for that. You can search that. Uh, there's an example of the code there. You can see that within five lines of code, what you've done is you've imported a library that allows Colab to then bring in a um, CSV data from um, from Google Sheets. Uh, so you've you've imported the Google Spreadsheet library, and then you've you've dragged that into your Colab file. It will ask for a verification code, and what that means is that you'll need to open up uh, a kind of authenticator. Uh, you'll need to give it permission to access that document, and then it will provide you with a verification code that you can copy and paste into into that field. Uh, once you've done that, though, you're rolling. Uh, you can turn that into a pandas data frame, and then you can use um, NumPy to transform that data in, in any which way you like, and you can start visualizing that with Matplot Library. Uh, there's an example screenshot on the right-hand side of a really short activity I did with some students where I found a CSV file on GitHub um, that contained just a ton of data on um, each element. So periodic table, data set, um, and then the students started seeing what kind of neat transformations they could make uh, that might show them some patterns between the periods and groups across the periodic table of elements. Um, I think I wrote that up actually on a, I think I've written that, I've written that up on, um, on the uh, Maker Learners website that, that I'm running. I will share that project in the description below. Uh, just look for periodic table of elements um, collab file, something like that. Um, okay. So once they've got their data in and they're making transformations, that's when you can really put your scientist hat on and start encouraging students to really think about what the correct visualizations are for answering specific questions. Um, so first of all, to answer a question, you can challenge them to, to select the right variables from a huge set data set. I mean, large data sets by their nature have a ton of data for different variables and we can't plot all of these variables on a single graph. So to answer a specific question, what are the two variables that we're interested in? What is the relationship between these two or perhaps three at most variables that we want to visualize? Then once the students have chosen those variables, the next question is, well, what type of visualization is going to make the answer to this, whether our hypothesis is supported or not, most obvious. Um, and then challenging the students to say, right, are we looking for the relationship between multiple variables? Do we want to see where a distribution kind of clusters? Um, or do we want to see how the entire data set is composed of various categories? Um, so that's where you can really start talking about the difference between quantitative and qualitative data um, and all sorts of things. Um, so that's where I think it's for me, it's at this stage that everything prior to it and all of the additional learning that I've had to do and creating the collab file all suddenly seems worthwhile because the amount of learning that happens here, the number of teachable moments that crop up um, really makes makes the entire thing um, seem worthwhile to repeat myself. Okay, so I've that's a kind of run through and in, in that run through we found sec we found um, secondary data on the likes of Kaggle or GitHub or um, using the Vernier or, or the Firefox libraries. Uh, another option, of course, in a science lab is to, to collect your own data. Um, now, there's a there's all manner of ways that we can do that. And the top two options here using data loggers like Vernier data loggers or using simulation data is um, something that we're probably already doing as, as physics teachers in, in secondary education. So I won't spend too long talking about simulations and data loggers. Um, hopefully most of us, if not all of us, are familiar with Tracker, which allows us to collect data from video files. Um, so by calibrating how many pixels represents what distance and by selecting the position of something as it moves frame by frame, 
um, we can we can gather all manner of um, of motion data on that thing. If you're not familiar with Tracker, I encourage you uh, to type that into a search engine as soon as this uh, this session's over, um, and to download that on your own machine and start playing with the with the Tracker program. Um, two things that I think less teachers are doing right now, but um, I think I think there's a lot of scope for um, for bringing into into science education is using students' own mobile phones, which have an array of sensors built into them already. Uh, mobile phones are, are powerhouses of, of data collection if you if you choose to use them for this. Um, so using the Firefox application, which is available on both Android and iOS, um, I think for iPads as well, but I haven't I haven't tried it with iPads and I've got an Android phone myself. Um, but the Firefox app will utilize all of the sensors on the phone for all manner of experiments. So it'll use the, the barometer sensor if, if you've got one. It'll use the um, X, Y, and Z um, acceleration using the accelerometer built into the into the mobile phone. It'll use your speakers, your microphone. Um, and if I'm honest, I'd, I don't think I realized just how many sensors there are in a, in a handheld mobile phone until I downloaded this app and started looking at the experiments I could run. Um, another option is to use the uh, small electronics components that you would use for a microcontroller like the Arduino Uno or, or the Microbit. Um, the appeal for me here is that these sensors are so cheap, you, you can buy them for, for next to nothing and you can easily give every single student in your classroom for a very small cost access to their very own um, sensors that can be turned into data loggers provided we do a little bit of a session on how to collect the data that the Arduino um, is being fed using these sensors. Uh, the Arduino then can either stream that to the student's own computer or to make it uh, a lot more remote and so that the computer doesn't need to be attached to the Arduino the whole time, you can use a, an SD card module to collect to collect that data. Uh, okay, uh, hello and Hopefully this is roughly where we left off. So yeah, the problems keep on keep on uh, being encountered. So uh, the camera that I'm using apparently has enough charge to record about 30 minutes straight video. Now we'd just started talking about the ways that you could use sensors that, that you would typically use with a, an Arduino creation uh, it, to collect scientific data. Now, this could be a really good solution for schools that can't afford their own data loggers um, or even schools that want to forego the ease of using data loggers in order to incorporate some electronics and coding uh, education into the, the experimental design process. And by experimental design, I mean, we can really go to town on, on using the design cycle to create a unique um designed environment in order to collect this experimental data. These sensors are small enough and the circuits are kind of extendable enough that we can build a unique environment or a unique housing or vessel or, or whatever to, to, to have this experiment run within. And it could be built in such a way that uh, attempts to control the, the control variables as much as, as possible. So we can see students really trying to, des to design out and things like uncertainty and noise. Um, so I think there's a, a there's really a lot that can be done with this. And I think um, I think this is getting a lot of attention and a lot of traction right now. The last slide I had to share with with everybody um, was the the fact that the Google Science Journal. Now I don't know if you've heard of Google Science Journal before, but it was uh, an application that you could install on both Android and iOS that again used the sensors within that device to collect data but uh, it is currently been um, it's currently moved to Arduino it's it's now called Arduino Science Journal I think that's a sign of Arduino realizing the um, the usefulness the utility of, of Arduino sensors within the science classroom um, so I think we're going to see a lot more of this in the in coming years similarly Firefox the um, the organization I mentioned previously that uses mobile phone data, uh, they've written an Arduino library, so uh, if an Arduino is connected to a computer or a phone via Bluetooth or perhaps by cable, I haven't um, I haven't experimented with this yet, 
Um, but you're then able to send data from the Arduino directly to the Firefox library, uh, to the Firefox application. And as we said earlier, the Firefox application will then push the data it, it's received into a Google Sheet file. So you've got a really simple bridge now from the Arduino and that designed uh, experiment, the data it collects to Firefox, Firefox to Google Sheets, and then Google Sheets to Google Colab, so we can explore that data. And if your sample rate is, you know, if you're taking a couple of samples each second, then over the course of an experiment, that's going to be a large data set. And those large data sets are perfect for using Python to interrogate. Um, so that's where I've got at the moment with uh, with students in, in my classroom, where I've gone with my own kind of learning and understanding. I'm excited to, uh, to dabble with this a bit more. Uh, and hopefully in, in sharing this with a wider community, other teachers will start experimenting as well. And we can start sharing best practices with one another. So that's everything from my end. That's everything from my presentation. Um, as I said, this has been post recorded because the first one, just the quality was all over the place. Uh, so I'm going to transition now into uh, Brian's live um, presentation that he gave during the event. Go. Okay, I see I am sharing my screen and I see my title slide. So I'm going to tab over there. Uh, thanks, everybody, for joining us. And thanks for the anonymous animals who are already here in uh, my slide deck. Um, this slide deck is open for you to comment on. So in addition to the um, chat and the Q&A, if you want to leave a comment on a specific spot on my slides, I'll also go back and review those later. Uh, my name is Brian. Uh, Anthony uh, introduced me earlier, but I'm uh, over at the University of North Florida over in the uh, United States. Um, uh, my talk is going to kind of complement Anthony's. I don't operate quite so much at the high level of computational thinking. I usually am just designing activities so that I can get them in front of students and I figure out what the students learned later. Uh, I also tend to operate more on the uh, simulation side than the uh, data collection analysis side, just you know, based on my background in computational condensed matter. So I just want to look at a few things. First, I want to uh, ask you for some input. What do you think we mean when we say computation? Uh, and then I want to talk about three resources um, that if I were starting out integrating computation into high school, undergraduate education, any kind of context, these are the places that I would start. So I want to start by, by hearing what you think. So let me know in the chat when you hear a physicist or a STEM person use this word computation, what do you think we mean? Or maybe when you use the word computation, what do you mean? Tell us what you think in the chat. Okay, we've got understanding problems and formulating solutions, right? I like that because that places it kind of in the middle of the process, right? Computation is never the beginning and it's never the end. It's always in between the problem and the solution, right? It's always, it's, it's a method we use in the middle. Uh, building algorithms to solve problems, right? So one of the ways you can use computation is to build algorithms. Uh, we've already seen, we might be using it to, um, we might be using it to, to visualize the solution, but also we build it to generate the solution itself. Uh, transforming data into something with an alternative use, right? So think about the survey data, Anthony, that you're thinking of collecting. Do you just want all of that survey data sneezed onto the page? Or do you need it in some format that's more digestible that you can extract meaning from? And then abstraction to visualization, so it covers the entire process. Great. These are all wonderful answers. We could cobble those together, I think, into a single second, uh, uh, into a single sentence. Um, the uh, the definition that gets cited a lot, um, uh, Eugenia and I were talking about Danny Caballero earlier, here he is again, uh, the use of a computer to numerically solve, simulate, or visualize a physics problem. And Anthony, I liked your word earlier about outsourcing. Uh, you know, basically you are outsourcing the heavy lifting of all this stuff to the computer, right? Because think about it. These are items that we could do on our own, right? We were numerically solving, simulating, and visualizing physics problems before computers. It was just a lot of hard work. And so the computer is there for us to outsource all of this stuff 
uh, to make it more straightforward. So computation can involve code writing, but like we saw in Anthony's picture earlier, it could involve working it out by hand. It could involve symbolic manipulation, right? So using uh, so using Mathematica or Maple, those are that is computation. It's algebraic manipulation rather than coding per se, but it's still computation. And so, um, in terms of my framework, I approach this from what we now call in physics education the three-legged stool. Um, is the idea that we use computation as a skill alongside experiment and theory. So 50 years ago, this pie would have looked very different. It would have been divided in half, and you would have had half dedicated to experiment and half dedicated to theory. And probably most of us, uh, depending on when we went through our, our formal education, we probably experienced that in our class. We had homework assignments and we have lab activities. Right. And so you have theory and you had experiment. And those were the two things that you did in a physics class. Well, now computers are so ubiquitous in the physics research world that we really have three legs to the stool. We have theory, we have experiment, we have computation. And some folks will really emphasize one over the other three in their work. And some folks will shift back and forth between them. I mean, computation is really kind of a bridge between theory and experiment in the sense that you have lots of theorists doing computation. You have lots of experimentalists doing computation. That's kind of the middle ground. But then you also have folks, like when I was in graduate school, who were completely dedicated to the computational aspect. And part of the issue that we're running into, and one of our goals in education now, is just to teach students that this third leg of the stool exists. So even if a student doesn't remember any computational methods or any computational concepts, if they just come out knowing that computational physics is a thing that exists, that is a mark of progress because most of our students today come in thinking it's only these two. Now, hopefully, and you know, within the next generation or two, that will start to shift and that will sort of be part of the standard understanding or visualization of what a physics wheel looks like. But for right now, you know, just getting students to visualize this wheel is a big deal. And so another reason this is a big deal is because computation is a high demand transferable skill. Uh, so the data you see on the screen here uh, is from the American Institute of Physics, a uh, relatively recent survey of, uh, a, of recent physics master degree graduates. And we see the same type of result for bachelor graduates and for PhD graduates as well. Then when you ask them, what do you spend most of your time doing in your job? Programming comes in pretty highly, especially in the private sector. Uh, more than 75% of respondents say that they use programming daily, weekly, or at least monthly. And so to the degree that we incorporate computation, we are helping our students prepare for their careers, right? If we make our classroom look like what their careers look like, that is better preparation. And this is showing that programming, what we call computation, is a very big deal there. And then even in the academic world, it's coming in at just under 75% there. Uh, and so uh, other educational reasons for using computation, it can overcome mathematical barriers, right? Think about the students who says, I'm bad at math, right? We know that there's really no such thing as being bad at math. It's really a mindset issue. Well, one of the ways we can help them get out of that mindset is by placing computational tools in front of them and saying the computer is going to do the math for you. And so you don't have to sit there and bang your head against the wall when you're trying to do this integral, the computer can do the integral for you. Uh, we talked about earlier, it also helped us visualize results. Another big deal that we are looking at in the physics education community is how computation enables us to solve new problems, right? right. The computation allows you to move beyond the block on an inclined plane, right? That That is a problem that doesn't deserve more than about five minutes in a physics course. And yet, because it's one that's relatively easy to solve analytically, we can end up spending an entire month on it. But with computation, it's possible to bring in problems that students couldn't solve otherwise, things like three-body gravitation or molecular dynamics or actually bringing in air resistance into a projectile problem, right? All these things that we shy away from when we're trying to solve the problem algebraically to the computer, it makes no difference, you know, how complicated or intractable the problem is. And so this is a really big deal as is identifying new problems that we are interested in putting in front of our students. So that gives you an idea of, of how I approach uh, integrating computation into, into physics. When I first started doing this, um, the, the major piece of advice was to provide your students with a starter code 
uh, to kind of jumpstart their process. Don't give them a code from scratch, give them something to start working with. And I really, I really liked that idea, but I was wanting to, you know, show my students where that starter code came from. And so based on that, I started a YouTube channel, Let's Code Physics. Uh, the link to it's up here in the title. Uh, but basically, I offer uh, computational physics tutorials with starter codes available in online editors. Uh, Anthony referenced uh, Google Colab. I very often share codes there. Uh, I also sometimes share codes over glowscript.org or trinket.io. The idea being that your students don't have to download and install anything, right? Because I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, directing students today to install software is a very foreign concept to them. So all of these codes run for free in the browser, no installation required. Um, here's an example of one where I was trying to show students the difference between quantum mechanical scattering and classical scattering of elect of uh, excuse me of photons off of electrons. And so this is a simulation written in GlowScript that uh, that shows the classical scenario. And so I have over 600 videos. Uh, I publish new tutorials at least every Monday. Usually I publish Monday and Wednesday. I'm kind of taking it easy this summer uh, while I have a lot of other commitments. Uh, most of my codes are written in Python. I'm looking to branch out at some point in the future. Um, and they mostly involve either solving differential equations or doing numerical integration. And so the Euler-Cromer method, which you saw in Hidden Figures, going back to Hidden Figures, is that brief moment where the Euler method appears there on screen, calculus, in a, in a blockbuster movie. Um, this is really my only trick. Nearly every video involves updating a function based on its derivative, and you can do a lot with that. Um, so, for example, here's a, here's a video from a series where I introduced the Euler-Cromer method. Um, actually, if you Google Euler-Cromer method, this series is like the, the first video result, or it's the second result right under Wikipedia, which I'm pretty proud of. But what I try to do in these videos is draw students' attention to where the actual physics is, right? So this part up here where they're setting up the graphs, I don't really care if the students know how to do that because they can just copy and paste that. But what I really care about is that they see we are setting up a vector to represent the momentum and then using that momentum to update the ball's position, right? That's where the physics actually is. Everything else is bookkeeping as far as the programming is concerned. I also leave some some room for fun items. Here is a here's a somewhat recent video where I made a um, hero Heroes Quest random map generator to celebrate the re-release of Heroes Quest. Um, I'm up to almost 10,000 subscribers. Been very honored by the positive reception among the physics education community. Folks will just take these videos, drop them in their class, and then assign the starter code uh, as an assignment. <clears throat> So the other big deal, the other probably more useful reference uh, that I would that I would provide to y'all is the pickup community. So when Anthony emailed me and said, uh, I'm trying to start this community of folks who can discuss how we use Python in our physics education, I said, have I got a URL for you? Because that's essentially what the pickup community is doing. Pickup's a little more formal about it. It's an offshoot of the American Association of Physics Teachers. Um, Anthony mentioned earlier, it's the Partnership for Integration of Computation and Undergraduate Physics, uh, but it's more than undergraduate. So we do have lots of high school teachers uh, involved in our community, um, and, and in fact, a growing resource there. And we are looking at expanding to beyond physics to math, uh, chemistry, et cetera, other STEM fields. We host webinars about once a month. Um, I'm on the webinar planning committee, and I can say we we, we average probably about 10 a year. Um, so we, we almost hit that goal of monthly. We also have annual workshops for first timers who are looking to just integrate computation for the first time. Uh, the next one is on July 20th, so a month from today. A registration I checked yesterday and registration was still open. Um, so highly recommend everybody go register for this. They are wonderful experiences. Um, these workshops provide both practical tips. If you're just looking to drop an exercise set into your course, there's practical advice. And then there's sort of broader computational thinking as well. Uh, the main um, uh, venue for the community is our Slack channel. Highly recommend everybody join the Slack channel. If you post a question there, you will get a response probably within about a day. It's very active uh, friendly community. We also offer focus sessions at APT meetings if you're able to make it over to the States. Um, these are very active meetings, very good experiences. Uh, Pickup also hosts a set of exercise sets. Um, uh, there's around 70 of these exercise sets. If you go to the tab called exercise sets, you'll find these uh, fully fledged computational activities that are peer reviewed by folks in the in the pickup community that you can just pick one of these up and drop it in your course with relatively little adaptation required. 
You can sort by course, academic context, are you teaching high school, are you teaching uh, undergraduate first year, undergraduate advanced, and even programming language to meet your particular needs. There's even more exercise sets under faculty comments. Those are just not peer reviewed and they're not necessarily as complete. Like they might not have a solutions guide or they might not have a theory section. Um, but if, if you're looking for a topic, there, there's enough here to cover an entire physics curriculum. We also encourage you to submit yours. If you have done anything in your class involving computation, you can submit to the pickup collection. There's no entry requirement. There's just a, 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 a template that we ask you to follow uh, that includes all of the bells and whistles that we hope that you'll have. We particularly need more topics besides gravity. There's probably about 11 gravitation assignments on there. There is nothing on Leonard Jones potential, even though it works almost exactly the same way as the gravitational potential. Um, and we need more methods besides the, the Euler method. So I hope that Anthony, you will submit an exercise set about your uh, use of those external data sets, because there's only one, I think, exercise set that does that right now. So let me conclude with some homework here. Uh, after we finish this, would love for everybody to watch a Let's Code Physics video. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, as the kids say. Uh, please come and join us on the Pickup Slack. We'd love to see all of you say hello uh, this evening. Uh, and find a pickup exercise set to try. Go ahead, just drop it into your course. Uh, uh, get some feedback from your students and then, you know, update it for, for the next time you try it. And then uh, if you want some extra credit, start thinking about an exercise set you would like to submit. If you would like help submitting an exercise set, I am happy to, to give it a once over before you submit it to review. Um, and then uh, if you really are interested in hearing my voice more, uh, go listen to the computation episode of Physics Alive. Physics Alive is a wonderful physics education podcast where uh, I was on in January to talk about uh, the use of computation um, in our education. Basically a rehash of everything we just talked about here, just a little bit more uh, information there. Cool, I do not see any comments over here on my slides, so I'm gonna head over uh, back to the chat and uh, hopefully get to continue the conversation there. Uh, we, we had one question pop up in the, the general chat asking if there were any WhatsApp groups um, that are currently live for this, this kind of discussion. I, I I am technically on a WhatsApp group with some like physics senior students who mm. like to just pose physics problems to each other. I don't know that they do anything particular physics education or computation related, but yeah, that's Slack seems to be the thing that we like over in over in uh, uh, the, the U.S. educational system for whatever reason. Yeah, I, I noticed mm. that uh, uh, here it seems to be Discord. So I'm in I'm on a yeah. number of Discord servers. Yeah. On, but only only slack for pickup so I, I try to get across there as as often as I can <laughs> okay um I I don't know if if uh, if anybody noticed I I my connection was abysmal then I'm so sorry Brian I that's all right <laughs> I, I thought maybe a fifth of of your your talk and you may have noticed that I, I've rematerialized in my in my laundry room because that's a bit closer <laughs> to the Wi-Fi router yeah um, I'm okay. hoping, I'm hoping that, that Betty has some magic that means that the, the video was still able to record your, I, I did like not your... check, but I do see the recording light is still on. So hopefully okay. well, if not, if not, I will repeat all of that back in my office and post it to my channel and we can just link to that. <laughs> thank you so much. If, if that is the case, Absolutely. I hope it's you. Um, okay. Yeah. I, do we have any, any questions in the Q and A? I do not see any. I, I do have one, and apologies if you if you touched on this in in your talk. Um, when I first tried finding Python physics resources, and we're talking years ago, um, one of the the only things I was able to find back then was a um, it was a I think it was like a, a minutes from a faculty meeting at um, I think it was UCL or maybe Imperial. It was it's one of the UK universities, and it, it was mostly it was mostly the bemoaning of um, the fact that these undergraduate physics students are joining to learn physics and they're spending most of their time, in fact, trying to teach them how to learn computation, how to, how to mm. learn to program. Um, is, that, is that still a problem? Is that, is that yet another reason why mm -hmm. programming 
might have some space in, in high school education. Yeah. So one of the questions that always comes up, and I mean, every single pickup meeting, usually the same people asking it is, how are you going to make room for all this? Right. Because yeah. they have this model in their mind where I have my curriculum and I have stuff I am supposed to cover and yeah. I'm already spending all of my time trying to cover everything and I can barely cover everything now. How am I supposed to shove computation in? And it's it's a valid concern and it's one we have to address before we can really expect this to be broadly adopted. And honestly, if anybody's looking for a PER project, I don't know that there's been a systematic study of how people integrate it in terms of, you know, making room in the curriculum. However, I personally would challenge that whole assumption because number one, anytime somebody says, well, I need to cover all this stuff, that's a red flag. Because, okay, what does it mean to cover something? Does it mean you flash the equations up on the board and your students have magically learned it? Like if, if your attitude is, I have to hit all these objectives, that's already, you know, the the, the place to, you know, to, to not be starting, right? Because we, we want the students to learn, right? Which is mm. different than covering something. And it's like, if, if, the, if the problem set and the experiment is not reaching the student, then what you are doing is already, you know, it, it's already spending too much time on those things. But if computation can help that student, then, mm. then it's worth finding a way to do. And so what I had to do when I wanted to integrate computation, it's hard and you have to, you really have to bite the bullet and do it. But I had to redesign my course. Like I, I had to tear it all down and I had to say, okay, I want my students to learn simple harmonic motion. Well, I can walk them through solving the differential equation. I do not expect them to do that on their own, but I can yeah. walk them through it. I can surely set up an experiment for it. It's one of the easiest experiments to set up, right? Whether with motion tracking or just with a stopwatch. And I can really easily get a code in there. Well, okay, that's three things to do. My class meet three days a week. So that is Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And I'll do it in whatever order makes the most sense, you know, for these students. And so part, you know, part of it is, there are some topics that we teach that honestly are better done with a code than with an experiment, right? I mean, I mean, think about when you teach constant velocity. That is a horrifically boring experiment to do. I mean, what what do you have them do? Walk across the room or, or, or you know, push a cart down an air track? It's horrifically boring. But with a code, it's not the most interesting animation, but it's the most direct way to teach them doing a loop and doing an update. It's just, okay, this D equals V times T. We're just going to do that over and over again and move the ball across the screen, you know? And you can talk about what happens when I make delta T smaller. You can talk about what happens when I make velocity a vector instead of just going in one dimension. What happens when I make the velocity a function of time? And suddenly you're integrating yeah. without actually doing calculus. And so I think, I think what you have to do is you have to look at what opportunities is computation going to unlock and where mm -hmm. do I want to take advantage of those opportunities? And what am I really not getting out of my homework sets in my labs and you don't, the, no one is going to come by and take away your physics card because you stopped doing a particular experiment, you know? Yeah. And I, I think that's the, the utility of that, that database that you showed us on pickup. I think we're, we're hopefully soon going to see which, um, you know, for which topics mm. in physics is computation, just the better modality for, for learning. Um, and I think hopefully they're, they're the topics that we're going to see cropping up and they're the ones that we're going to see people actually taking hold of and realizing, oh, if I do it this way, yeah. it's a better visualization of the problem for students. Well, then, and I'm giving a talk uh, next month at AAPT and I, I'm talking about how I use computation in my modern physics class where the students first meet quantum mechanics. And my opening is I show them the pages of Griffith's textbook where he solves the harmonic oscillator problem. And right. it is complete and it will teach you, it covers the material, but who honestly learns anything by reading it? And then on the right, I have a screen capture of working through a computational code to get the boundary conditions to work for the harmonic oscillator wave function. And that's something in principle, a high school freshman can do. If you teach them how to use the sliders on the screen, they can do this thing and in kind of conceptually learn the quantum mechanics. They, they, they're not going to understand the ins and outs of the math, but do they really have to understand every line of this derivation that they're never going to repeat except to teach it? And so my yeah. question to the audience is going to be, which, which is 
a, a more engaging learning experience for our students, flipping pages in a static textbook that no one remembers, or wrangling this function into behaving and discovering there's a magic energy, dare we say, an eigenvalue, where it works, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I do want to address something uh, Hauken said in the uh, chat. They mentioned GeoGebra. I, I have it on my list to go learn GeoGebra and Desmos because I will tell you the the math educators are doing a really good job of teaching the students to go to GeoGebra or Desmos to visualize, to figure out how to, how to, how to, how to compute something because they'll just bring it out in my class and I don't tell them to use it because I don't even know how to use it. And 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 they just use it. I'm like, well, why are you using this? Like, well, we used it in my math class and I found it to be helpful. I'm like, good for you. Yes, you use that. We have zero GeoGebra or Desmos exercise sets on the pickup collection. If if you are using that in your class, then please, by all means, submit an exercise set from GeoGebra or Desmos. I guarantee you it'll get published because we don't have any of it currently. I, I've, I've got a similar hope with um, a, a package called Algodoo. Yes, um, love algo do. So that's that's mm -hmm. something that I'm I'm not particularly well versed in. Um, but one of the uh, writers for In Thinking, which is uh, an IB um, publishing, um, so for the physics section, uh, Chris Hampert, uh, mm -hmm. he uses do quite quite often actually, and he's mm -hmm. he's written a number of activities that uses that um, that tool. So I, I I see it being used, and every time I open it, I'm just a bit overwhelmed with. Uh, with how much functionality it has, you know, how many things that you yeah. can actually you can actually change and set. Uh, so I'd like to I'd like to sit down with that for a while and, and get my head around it. Um, but yeah, the, the chat has just been lighting up. <laughs> it's yes. been crazy. To see. I finally got around to answering Eugenio's question. Yeah, Eugenio asked the question: What do you do? How how do you help a colleague who has no programming experience? Right, because we we come on and we preach computation, computation, and some teachers sit there saying, "Well, I never learned how to program." Yeah. The pickup workshops assume you have zero knowledge of programming yourself. And so we take you through, here is a sample exercise set that your students can use to get you experienced enough. And then by the end, we get you writing your own activities because we have to teach the students this stuff because, you know, it's not necessarily in their curriculum. And even if they have had an intro to programming course, it's probably taught by a computer science person who's more concerned about building web pages or cell phone apps. I mean, they don't teach numerical integration. We have to teach them that anyway. Well, this so, yeah, that, that was one of the, the final things I wanted to, to touch on with you. You mentioned a meeting on July 20th. Um, yes. What, is that a single meeting? Is that is that a course over a week? Or that what? is, that yeah, that's an intensive workshop. Let me find out how long it is. When they're in person, they're usually over a weekend. Uh, okay. I don't know what the virtual version is like uh july 2021 uh oh excuse me okay so the asynchronous pre-workshop period is july 6th through july 19th so i guess they have some work for you to do before then and then the workshop itself goes uh let me just you know what let me just post paste in the information it goes over the 20th the 21st and the 22nd um here we go. Yeah, the priority registration deadline, I guess, is today. So uh, still, still, uh, uh, you know, a few hours left to register for that. Um, right. Here is the, yeah, here is the actual link to the workshop. There we go. Okay, well, I know yep. what I'm doing as soon as I get off this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you look at the description in red, this workshop is a very basic primer on integrating computation and introductory courses with easy to use rate available uh, computational tools. No programming experience whatsoever is necessary to participate. So there you go. I will um, be yeah. Right. Um, okay. So registration is open until July 13th or until, um, or until uh, spots are filled. So July, June 20th is the day that they guarantee you have a spot. Priority registration. Yeah. I've got you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, right, brilliant. I, I love I love how much activity there's been in the chat, and I'm really really keen to have another Python physics meet uh, soon. So anybody listening, if you want to know about that, please join the um, Code Academy Dubai chapter. That means you'll get an email anytime there's an event created. Um, do join the Slack uh, for pickup. Um, a link for that as well. There we go. Yeah, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. All right, 
Fantastic. Okay, and hopefully we can keep the conversation going via Slack and, uh, and hopefully we'll have some future meetings too. Okay, so thank you for joining us in, in watching this video. I just wanted to say at the end that the next Python physics event that I would like to hold, um, I would like that to be a bit of a showcase. So if these uh, presentations have inspired you in any way to try and find your own activities that you can run with students, please do consider sharing that at our next meeting. Uh, it can be as brief as a, a five minute rundown on what you've done with the students or maybe you'd like to take a, a 10, 15 minute showcase of, of the really awesome things that you've, you've managed to do with the Python programming language within your own physics lessons. Um, if you're not an educator, you can still showcase things that you've made that may be of value to other educators. Um, I'm really hoping that this community will become a kind of blend of those interested and, and highly skilled in programming and those interested in teaching uh, physics using the art of programming so uh, whichever side of that fence you you lie on if you've been inspired to do something amazing today uh, please do reach out uh, to me through the python physics community um, and I'd, I'd love to have you showcase something at our next event uh, the next event will likely take place in about august time uh, this month in july i'd like to focus on machine learning in education um, and then if I think if we can have Python physics running every other month, I think that gives people enough time to watch, respond to and build something new uh, between meetings. So we can meet about six times, a, uh, six times a year. Hopefully that's not too, too ambitious. So please do join the community. As I said, the links in the description, please do join Let's Code Physics. There are videos coming out all the time that are super useful for physics educators. Uh, and please do have a look at the pickup community also. During Professor Lane's uh, segment, there was uh, quite a bit of talk about the upcoming uh, pickup um, event. I believe the 13th is the deadline for that, so there are still a couple of days left to sign up if, uh, if there's space for that event. Uh, I, I know that I've signed up myself, so hopefully I'll see some of you there. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.